Okay, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are in the session Intentionally Diverse Learning Communities. Welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Hannah-Jones and I'm a reporter um, at the New York Times Magazine and I have spent probably the last three or four years writing uh, almost exclusively about housing and school segregation and some of you may have heard my This American Life piece that ran the summer on, oh, thank you. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to put my bio up um, <laughs> on segregation in Michael Brown school district. So we are here today to, of course, talk about um, the title is diverse learning communities, but I like to call it integrated learning communities. Um, so before we start, just a couple of housekeeping things. We'd like to encourage anyone who'd like to tweet the session to use the hashtag TFA25. And also, uh, we're going to be passing out note cards for people who may have questions during the Q&A session. Write your questions down, as many questions as you have, and you're going to pass them out to the aisles. And there will be people here from TFA who will be picking up those cards, and that's how we're going to do Q&A. Um, OK, so let's start then, like I said, with the definition. These days, the word diversity is largely um, replace integration when we talk about schools. But I think that that kind of belies the importance of what it is that we're talking about. Diversity kind of sounds cute and nice, and it sounds like something that's about feeling good about ourselves. Um, I think it's, integration speaks to an imperative. Integration speaks to justice, and integration speaks to ensuring equality for black and brown students. So. Throughout this conversation today, I'm going to be talking very specifically about integration and not diversity as something that's nice to have, but integration as an imperative if we want educational equality in this country. So to begin with, let's just, we're going to kind of do an exercise. The interesting thing about integration is it's actually very hard to define. What is the integrated school district in Fargo, North Dakota versus New York City? What do integrated schools look like? So for these purposes, we're going to use a definition that if a, a school is, let's say, about 90% um, white or 90% black and Latino, that those would be what are typically considered intensely segregated schools. And so somewhere in between, no matter what the district looks like or the demographics of the district would be an integrated school. Because for instance, New York City is a very segregated district because you have a lot of white suburbs and very few white students uh, within the district. So let's just start by saying how many of you in the audience attended an integrated school growing up? If you could stand. If you attended what you would consider an integrated school. Okay. Now, how many of you are now teaching in integrated schools? So I think you can sit, thank you. Uh, that's a pretty stark way to look at what it is that we're dealing with. We're dealing with a lot of teachers who themselves have not gone through integrated education and who are now going into extremely segregated um, teaching situations and teaching students whose, whose circumstances are very often different than the circumstances that you all had to deal with. And it also speaks to how far things have come and not come since Brown v. Board ruled that separate schools were inherently unequal 60 years ago. What we know is that if you, like me, were a child of the 70s, then you would have grown up during the peak of integration in this country. And since then, we've actually been going backwards. So what I'm going to do briefly is start off with a history to kind of ground us in the struggle for integrated schools in this country. Um, there's a lot of mythology about Brown, Brown v excuse me, Brown v. Board. And there's a lot of mythology about how hard we tried to integrate schools and why uh, it failed. So let's start with the ruling itself. Most people know Brown v. Board um, barred segregation in schools, legally mandated segregation in schools. But I find that most people have actually never read the ruling. And they don't understand that Brown was actually not about unequal resources in schools, as we often think. We often think that Brown came about because black schools were inferior in terms of resources. The ruling of Brown actually says that even if all the resources in a black school were the same as the resources in a white school, because we have a country built on racial caste, those two schools can never be equal. Because 
black students who are forced to go into their own schools are treated as inferior and come to believe that they are inferior. And when you separate those students from power, and power in this country is white, then that means that you cannot have equality in schools, even if they have the same quality of teachers, even if they have the same textbooks and the same facilities. But we've come to read Brown in a very different way. We've come to read it as, as long as we, um, that the problem that Brown was trying to get at was the inequality in tangible things, but it actually was getting at the inequality in intangible things. Those things like, do you have access to um, the people who run things in your community? Do you have access to um, status and that sort of thing? And then what Brown also says is that education is probably the most important American institution that we have because it's through education that people are able to get full citizenship. And that by separating black students and then later on in further rulings, Latino students, we're actually preventing black and brown Americans from gaining full citizenship by segregating them in schools. So what happens? The myth is often, the court rules in 1954 and suddenly our nation is like, oh yeah, that was, that was wrong what we were doing. So we're going to integrate now and everything would be okay. And then we go to quickly that we had busing and busing ruined everything and it was over. But the truth is, the laws passed in 1954 and the South immediately enters into what was called massive resistance. It refuses to comply with the law. The North, places like New York, uh, Boston, Chicago, doesn't actually even think that the law applies to them. So it takes a full decade, 1964, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and that gives Congress finally the ability to act against districts, and it gives the Department of Justice the ability to sue districts who are not complying with Brown. So as you see from the slide, 10 years after Brown, just 1% of black students in the South were actually attending school with white children. So we did not have an immediate downfall of segregation. It took 10 years, and then it took another four years with another ruling that came out of the Supreme Court, uh, the Green ruling, which actually forced real desegregation. It said that districts were gonna have to do things that actually got black kids into white schools. Um, and also that they would have to integrate teachers and staff and all of those things. And that's when you really saw, at least in the South, um, the walls of segregation tumble. Within a couple years of that ruling, um, you had the majority of black students in the South were now attending uh, schools with white students. Um, unfortunately, the ruling didn't really have much of an impact on the North. So while you were seeing massive desegregation in the South, you were seeing no desegregation in the North. And to this day, the most segregated parts of the country for black students are all in the North and the Midwest. And for Latino students, they're in uh, the West, namely California. And so I often, um, I'm actually working on a piece now about northern segregation because when I write about segregation, we like to believe that this is a southern problem. We like to think that this is a problem of those backwards folks down there, and it is absolutely not. Um, just a couple days ago, there was an anniversary in New York of the largest civil rights action in the history of our country. And that action was a massive boycott of over 400,000 students who didn't go to school in New York City to protest their segregation. This is something that we don't hear about. We all know about the March on Washington, but we don't know there was actually a larger um, civil rights action than that. And it was about what was called segregation in the best of the Georgia tradition. So we started to see some small moves towards desegregation in the North because the, the, court was, the federal courts were starting to find that in fact, even though you didn't have Jim Crow laws in the North, there was segregation was still happening through official policy, that school board members were voting and were drawing district lines in ways that segregated students. And so you started to see some progress in the North. And then in 1974, there was a famous ruling that came out of Detroit called Milliken v. Bradley. And Milliken v. Bradley basically made it impossible or very difficult to force uh, school districts in the North to desegregate. And what it said was, um, because what happened in Detroit and in many cities, as you all know, is basically all of the white residents just left the city and they went to white suburbs. And so there were no, no students in the cities to integrate with. 
And so the, a judge in Detroit ruled that the white suburbs were going to have to integrate with the city, and that was how you were going to get integration, and the Supreme Court stopped that. And it said that you actually could not order cross-district desegregation if you couldn't prove that the suburbs had intentionally segregated students. The problem was there were no black students in white suburbs to segregate, and so you were going to have a hard time finding liability. So after 1974, we um, begin to see a series of rulings from the court for the first time actually pulling back uh, desegregation law. And by 1988, uh, desegregation has peaked. So we really only had one generation where we really tried to integrate schools, and during that one generation, we did really well. We saw massive desegregation, particularly in the South, and the achievement gap narrowed to the lowest that it's been. We have, not, we have yet to get back to that point as we started to resegregate. What we saw is, um, as school districts began to be released from their federal court orders was huge spikes in the segregation of black students. So what this is showing are the top 10 most rapidly resegregating districts in the country. So these are districts that had undergone a great deal of integration, were released from their federal orders to desegregate. And as you see, zero marks the, the year when they were released from their orders. And as you see, immediately, when districts were not forced by the law to maintain integration, they started taking actions as segregated students. And then we get to my hometown, where my daughter is a public school student, uh, which is New York City. New York City has the most segregated schools in the country for black and Latino students. Um, Black and Latino students in New York, there's only one city that has more kids in what are called apartheid schools, which are schools that are 99% black and Latino. And the only other, there's only one other city. Can anyone guess what that other city would be that has more apartheid schools in New York? Chicago, exactly. Another great liberal northern city. And then what we've also found is with Latinos, where Latinos, when they were relatively small, no, part of the population were fairly integrated in schools. There hasn't been very much case law um, around Latinos' right to an integrated education, but there is a law that says that uh, black and Latino students have faced similar circumstances, and so black and Latino students in one school is not considered an integrated school. They are still being segregated again away from white Americans. And we are seeing that the segregation of Latino students is growing tremendously. And in many places, their numbers are now matching those of black Americans. And uh, where black Americans are facing segregation both by income and by race, Latinos, of course, are facing segregation by income, by ethnicity, and by language. This is a stat I think that um, is very important for us to think about, is really for more than 200 years, black Americans have been about 13% of the population of our country, which means it should be impossible numerically, unless we're trying really hard, that black kids can be so segregated in schools being only 13% of the population. Yet even at the peak of integration, we've never had a point in time where even half of black kids have attended majority white schools. And we need to be clear that though we've gone back to neoplasism, which believes that, okay, we tried integration and it didn't work, so now we're just gonna make those separate schools equal, which is exactly what Brown ruled against 60 years ago, we have yet to do that for one day in this country. You can look at statistics coming out of the US Department of Education, and if you have a school that's heavily black and Latino, you can predict the quality of every aspect of education in that school by the race of the kids in that school. They're the least likely to get everything that we know that kids need to give them uh, an equal chance. And then we pretend that we have an educational meritocracy. And when they apply to college, we want to say, why couldn't you get the same test scores as someone else? Um, why didn't you take the same classes? We are literally have an educational system that, that is still deeply entrenched in caste. But I think what's more important, oftentimes when we're talking about school integration or when we're talking about um, school reform, we talk about test scores. Those of you who are educators know that test scores are a very small part of what schools are doing in providing opportunity. It's not an achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap. And what the data shows when you study out uh, the longitudinal data is that segregated schools 
equal segregated life, and that these children are actually being set up for the rest of their lives to be less healthy, to be more likely to be involved in crime, to be more likely to pass poverty on to their own children. When children have the chance to go to integrated schools, it changes their lives. I'm a product of busing myself, and I can tell you that it changed my life. It's not, and I always emphasize this when I report on this, that it is not that black and Latino kids get smarter by being next to white kids. They get the same resources. And we have never in this country gotten to the point where we will provide those kids the same resources if they are not in the same classrooms as white children. That's just a fact. And I think it's also important, I'm an investigative reporter, so I don't just write about segregation and say it's happening and it's bad. I show how it's happening. And none of this is accidental. People are making decisions for children that keep them trapped in segregated high poverty schools. It's how they're drawing school attendance zone lines. It's where they're placing their resources. It's housing policy. All of this is intentional policy that has a very predictable result. And I think we need to stop t talking about it as if segregation and inequality somehow floats down magically from the sky. This is created. That means it can be undone. And so if you listen to my This American Life piece, what I said in that piece, which is somehow turned into this revolutionary thought, is that integration works. It's not revolutionary. There are literally, every person who is an educator has seen the data, has seen the studies, that shows that social economic integration and racial integration does close the opportunity gap. We know that. Yet we as a country, because politically, we are unwilling to do what we know works, are willing to just continue to perpetuate inequality when we know what the answers are. So with that said, that's kind of the, the history, and that's our charge today. We're going to be hearing from a group of panelists who are trying to do that work in an educational landscape that has been very hostile to efforts to integrate. Um, so once again, if you have questions, please write them on the note cards, and we are going to go ahead, I'm going to introduce each panelist, and each panelist is going to give you a five-minute presentation, a case study of the schools um, that they are running and, the, and their efforts, and then we're going to go into question and answer between myself and the panelists, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so first we're going to welcome up Christy Dragon, who is the co-founder and CEO of Citizens of the World Charter School. Hello, my name is Christy Dragon, and as Nicole shared, I am the CEO and co-founder of Citizens of the World Charter Schools. It's great to be here today. Our schools are a network of diverse by design charter schools. And what we mean by that when we say diverse by design is that we currently focus on neighborhoods that are already diverse and we seek to maximize the diversity that exists in the neighborhood in the walls of our school. So we're not actually talking about any kind of forced integration at this point. And we're not talking about something that I think we see all too often in schools, which is a school that may be technically diverse when you do the macro analysis of the population, but when you get into the school building, and maybe it's the case that children who attend this neighborhood zip code, live here, look like this, are on this track, and kids who attend this neighborhood, live in this neighborhood, or look like this, are on this track. That wouldn't be a school that actually lives to the ideals of the way we think about diverse by design. And so instead, what we're trying to do is say, once you have a diverse student population, you can leverage that diversity in order to ensure that all of your children become sophisticated thinkers who do master content, but that they actually then develop a sense of responsibility for themselves and for all people, and that by designing the school, you can achieve those outcomes. And so there are hundreds of people who are working in Citizens of the World across the three states where we have schools, and a couple of them are here today, so I don't give the impression that I'm the one doing all of this work. I'd like to ask a couple of folks to stand. If you are here and working for Citizens of the World, can you just stand up for a second? Buried in that row, Krupa Desai and Hillary Johnson are two of the founding members of Citizens of the World. And so as someone who started this, knowing that people would come to this idea with just a belief that this matters, that integration matters, I want to say a public thank you to both of you. Thank you. 
So a little bit about why I do this work. I was asked to share what's the why behind Citizens of the World for me personally. And so there are three experiences from my life that I'd like to talk a little bit about. The first is I grew up in the American South, very segregated community. I have a mixed racial and ethnic background. And my experience was issues of race and class were talked about often, and often talked about because there was a lot of conflict. And so I had some insight and some understanding as a very young child into this notion of difference and what happens when difference is unknown. And then when that unknown difference becomes feared. And then when that fear turns to hate. And then when that hate turns to this notion of otherness, and that otherness keeps us from becoming the people that we could be in communities because we no longer know how to work together, how to live together. And so I carried that with me through college and into law school. And in law school, I had the opportunity to work in juvenile court. And in my experience, I represented in a city that was diverse, maybe segregated in the way people lived, but the total population was diverse, economically and racially. All of my clients were African American. So all the children who were being accused of crimes that I was representing were African American. They all lived in the same public housing project. They were all repeat offenders. They were all under the age of 10, and sometimes they were presented shackled at the wrist and the ankle to the judge. And so I gathered this understanding and insight of what happens when this notion of otherness becomes institutionalized. And when the very systems and structures in which we live have an other, and that other is prejudiced and biased by our actions, and the cost of that, not just for our communities, but for the country that we aspire to be. And I carried those insights with me into my first year teaching as a Teach for America Corps member in 1998 in Los Angeles. And that year I had my first child, which is not the most strategic thing I've ever done, for the record. <laughs> but one of the greatest things I've ever done to become a mother. And the gift that gave me is I entered public education not just as a professional, but I was a parent in the system. And so I was looking for a school that was going to provide the things that I valued for my daughter. And those things were about tested and measured skills to some extent, but it was much more than that. I wanted to know, is she going to learn how to collaborate across lines of difference? Will she develop compassion? Will she have a value that says what's different about us actually makes us stronger? And I wanted to know that she was going to have the courage to find her voice, to use her voice for good, and to fail and stand up and try again. And I couldn't find that school. I couldn't really even find a school that was diverse because to the data that we just looked at, many of the schools in our city, although Hollywood, California, where I was living at the time, is extremely diverse, the schools were not. And so Citizens of the World was in some ways born of this idea of the things that we wrestle with and think if we really do want to solve the problems, the problems we face today that we know are only going to continue tomorrow, what is it going to take in school design to ensure that we're doing something differently and something that will lead to a better outcome? Some of the nuts and bolts of our schools, we are in Kansas City, Missouri, starting in 2016. We have schools in New York, Brooklyn, New York, and in Los Angeles, California. Our purpose is to realize human potential by strengthening the bonds among us and developing true citizens of the world. And our mission is to impact and expand the conversation about what an excellent education contains, requires, and accomplishes. And this is our attempt to broaden that definition of success. We are still about things that are tested and measured. I want to make that clear, but we believe there's actually more, that it's, not, it's necessary but not sufficient to just be focused on the tested and measured aspects of academics. There's demand for our schools. We had over 3,000 applications for about 500 seats across the network. And if you look at kindergarten, over 2,000 of those applications were coming in for 250 spots in kindergarten. The network itself, 68% of our students across our three states, students of color. 51% qualify for free or reduced price lunch. 14% are language learners. And because hopefully I still know my audience well when I'm in a Teach for America setting, I thought I'd share some of our academic data. The last Common Core assessments, we outperformed on average across the state and in LAUSD, second largest school district in the country. Our subgroups outperformed all subgroups in LAUSD on average. And our comparative data, which was not released this year, but from the year prior, our founding school is placed in the top 6% of over 800 public schools in Los Angeles. So thank you for allowing me to share a little bit. I'm looking forward to the panel. And I just want to say, seeing this many people excited to talk about intentionally diverse communities is inspiring to me and gives me great hope. So thank you all for being engaged in the conversation. OK, so our next uh, speaker is Bill Kurt, CEO of Denver School of Science and Technology.
Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's always a challenge to follow Christy, who's so eloquent on this topic. But I, I also am very excited to see so many of you care about this issue. I believe integrated schools are the social conscience of our future. I believe that because as our country continues to become more diverse, continues to include more and more voices, our schools across the country, as Nicole said, are becoming more and more segregated. We have an opportunity, and I believe in what Nicole said, we have an opportunity today to do something about that. The question is, do we have the courage? Do we have the vision? Do we have the commitment to make what I think is the most important thing we can do for the health of this social fabric in our country? As Nicole said, I'm the CEO of DSST Public Schools in Denver. Uh, we run today 10 schools, six middle schools, four high schools serving 4,000 students. Uh, we are integrated schools. Uh, let me just see if I can get you here. Um, and we are currently growing to become 22 schools in Denver serving 25% of the 612 student population, uh, 10,500 students. We, like Christie, are very committed to creating diverse schools in the true meaning of diversity. Uh, about two-thirds of our students come from families, uh, food reduced lunch families, and one-third of our students do not. And as you can see, our, our diversity eth ethnically is, uh, I think, is reflecting the city of Denver uh, and reflects the great fabric of our nation. I think it's important to point out, and I think this is critical to this movement because we do care about schools that work, uh, to talk about the fact that I think integrated schools are the best schooling for everybody. And they're schools that work. And I, I, I show this slide, the last uh, time Denver Public Schools uh, did a school performance framework, which is a comprehensive measure of school performance, including academic and non-academic measures. Um, in 2014, DSST Public Schools had five out of the top six public schools in Denver out of 181 public schools. There's always a debate about whether these schools work for all kids, and I would submit uh, that our data shows they do. I think the other really important point, and Nicole has been really eloquent on this nationally, is that there is no better strategy in my mind to close the opportunity gap than to create integrated schools. And you see here uh, ACT scores of our juniors versus the juniors in Denver Public Schools, and you see a tremendous difference in the opportunity gap uh, that we're providing. 18% for our students, which in my view is 18% too many, versus over 41% in Denver Public Schools. I don't believe as an organization we're smarter or better than anybody else. I believe simply that the structure we've created around integrated schools allows us the opportunity to serve kids better, uh, more effectively, because we've given everybody that same, same opportunity. As I said, I believe integrated schools are the conscience of our future. We have to imagine a world in 50 years where we will be a majority-minority country. We have to imagine in 50 years at this current rate where we will have the most segregated schools we've ever had in this country. There's nothing that can be positive about that for any individual, community, or our country if we don't do something about it. How do we think about integrated schools at DSST? There's a couple things, and I don't have time to go through all of these, but I would say, number one, we start from a, a belief in the human condition, a belief that every person desires to wake up in the morning to be affirmed for the very unique gifts and talents they've been given. And we also believe that every person wakes up in the morning and wants to make a positive contribution to this thing called the human story that we're all a part of. And we start our equity work, our inclusive work, our work uh, around maximizing the talents of each one of our people based on that view of the human condition. Um, I believe a world-class education is critical to integrated schools. And I believe widening our lens, particularly uh, of those of us who have come from privileged backgrounds, is critical to understanding the experience, 
of our students, of our staff, and creating a truly inclusive and integrated culture. As we look to the future to create more integrated schools, and I hope many of you in this room will come back five years from now and say, I've started an integrated school or I'm working in an integrated school because we need more of these, I think there's three things we need. Number one, we truly need public leadership. I was reflecting, I did this panel five years ago, the 20th, and I actually believe it's harder today to do integrated schools than it was five years ago. And that's a scary thought. We need a committed coalition of educators, of leaders, of community leaders to drive this effort forward. We need great schools. We need all of our families to be able to choose schools because they are highly effective schools. If we don't do that, we won't reintegrate public education uh, in this country. And I do also believe that we need to create another generation of our young student leaders who are our students who have now graduated from us. They come back and tell us how unintegrated their college experience has been. And they come back and tell us how important it is them to create a new society, a new set of schools, a new set of institutions that embraces the diversity of our schools. Uh, and I think we have to amplify the voice and the opportunity of this next generation. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation today. Thank you uh, for coming. Okay, next speaker is Julie Goldstein, uh, principal of Breakthrough Magnet School. Thank you. Thank you. Little different view, I'm going to be talking mainly about Breakthrough Magnet School, but before I start, I'd like to start by acknowledging the people who are responsible for my invitation today um, by Elisa Villanueva Beard, um, Teach for America's Executive Vice President of Alumni Affairs, Andrea Persley. Vice President of Alumni School Leadership, Hillary Lewis, and the Director of Alumni School Leadership Team, Katie Curley. They are the masterminds behind the Schools to Learn From program, which is how I've gotten connected to Teach for America in the last couple of years, and also to Nate Snow, who is the Executive Director of TFA Connecticut, and his amazing team, so thank you. Um, I believe that as educators, we are truly helping parents to raise our nation's children as opposed to simply providing instruction and supervision. In an article submitted to the Morehouse campus paper called The Purpose of Education, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Connecting this to the ideals he shared in his I Have a Dream speech, I also believe that quality education that places equal value on excellence in academics and character development prepares students for success in college and life and creates the potential for world peace. The summer after our last Teach for America summit, thanks to Teach for America's partnership with Hartford Public Schools, I sat down with a job interview with Breakthrough Magnet School's founding principal, Norma Newman Johnson. She explained that after many years as an educator in Hartford, 20 of those devoted to the conception, development, creation, and growth of Breakthrough Magnet School, a character education-themed interdistrict pre-K to eighth grade school, she was looking for a qualified successor who she could train and pre prepare to take her place. And I gasped, immediately noting the parallel between Teach for America's timeline and imagining it in the way Wendy Kopp might approach her own transfer of knowledge and responsibility should she choose to leave her work. Deeply understanding the personal devotion and commitment to conceiving of and growing an idea into a powerful organization that's not only changing the field of education, but is also tipping the needle of social justice towards prosperity and peace, I also practically jumped into her arms in my enthusiasm. And I want to take another minute to add an, an overlapping component on this timeline, the story of magnet schools in Hartford, in Greater Hartford. First off, there are over 4,000 magnet schools across the United States, which by definition are free public schools of choice that are operated by school districts or a consortium of school districts and use state, district, or common core standards, have a mission and vision that are centralized around a special theme, built in the foundation, on the foundation of five pillars of diversity, innovation, academic excellence, and high quality instructional systems, and family and community partnerships. 
the way diversity shows up varies across districts, and Hartford is one of the most highly regulated magnet programs in the country because of its unique history. In 1989, lawyers followed a lawsuit referred to as Chef versus O'Neill on behalf of Hartford families against the state of Connecticut, stating that the combined effects of segregation and poverty resulted in an inferior educational system that violated the constitutional rights of city school children. Thirteen years later, the case ended in a settlement that charged the State Department of Education with finding the solution. The result is a highly regulated lottery system that aims to ensure that at least 40% of Hartford students participate in magnet or open choice programs. 50% of magnet students in Hartford and the other half come from over 25 surrounding areas. In order to be considered compliant, there is a component related to race and 25% of students must, be, must identify in racial categories that are considered non-isolated white and Asian. So 75% would be mainly black and Latino. And I've got a lot to say, so that's why I'm I've prepared. So um, I'm reading a lot, so excuse me for that. Um, so in 2002, Breakthrough Magnet School became Hartford's pre -K, first pre-K to eighth grade interdistrict magnet school. And now between Hartford Public Schools and another consortia and districts, there are 50 magnet schools. Themes range from STEM to IB to performing arts and Montessori to name a few. 16 of us in Hartford are recognized by Magnet Schools of America as schools of distinction or excellence. And this year, Breakthrough Magnet School received Magnet Schools of America's most prestigious award, allowing us to say that ours is the number one school in the country based on high academic performance, innovation, partnership, and fidelity to theme. And it's what got our, the attention of um, Nicole and her team, I think. Um, so just a couple of things that we do have really great results. I think that you're right, Nicole, about the resources being the main driving factor. Um, and I just, again, love our character, our character focus and that we're helping to raise students who are intrinsically motivated. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what sets us apart um, from the other themes that I just described is that when Norma Newman Johnson conceived of the idea for breakthrough, she also designed the theme. The character education curriculum is based on five core principles which spell out the appropriately strong brick and result in students who are intrinsically motivated to be diligent, mindful, creative, upstanding, purposeful, lifelong learners. It's a curriculum that promotes social emotional learning and it results in self-actualization. Our systems and structures are all designed with brick in mind and include training for all new staff for the first half of the school year in the brick lessons and the systematic training for effective parenting, which also is open to parents all year. I provide a training for the first half of the year for parents as well. And each year we set a school-wide learning objective for character, which we monitor with our rubric-based character grades. We offer vertically aligned core curriculum and many enrichment courses, multiple field trip experiences, technology, a school-wide book club, and school-wide mindfulness. Teams plan and review data together weekly, and students re receive brick lessons in their mixed grade classrooms and weekly with the entire school. Finally, community meeting on Fridays is one of our key features as we all get together each week for student-led presentations, skits, and town hall conversations. We have mindfulness once a month and even have a line dance to Calvin Harris's Let's Go. <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook at Breakthrough Magnet School South or Visitor's Day is every Friday from 8 to 10, so you're all invited to come and see us in action. And I look forward to this conversation. There's a lot more to talk about. Thank you. Okay, and our final case study is uh, Jeremy Chapetta. Did I say right? No. Uh, Executive Director, aka Lead Helper. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so excited to be here. Uh, I was the um, founding principal of our first school, and as my son likes to say, Daddy, you used to be the principal, and now you're just a helper. Um, 
And so as executive director, I help by tweeting. Um, so please follow me on Twitter and help me get the word out about our work. Um, but, um, but before we, we really go further in this conversation, I just want to acknowledge and name something, which is as a white male on a mostly white panel um, talking about integrated schools, I just want to like, name my white privilege and, um, and say that and acknowledge it and, and, and know that I'm learning each and every day how to do this work better. And, um, and this work can be really hard. And so I just want to say all of that um, because I think as we get into the Q&A and we get into the conversation, um, a lot of different themes are going to come out that, that really are rooted in that, which is rooted in the last 60 years um, and beyond. Um, so Blackstone Valley Prep, we are a network of high-performing public charter schools in Rhode Island, and um, our mission um, is to prepare every one of our scholars for success in college and the world beyond. And I say that um, knowing that our model has a number of key elements that I think you'll see in lots of great high-performing schools that are often highly segregated, right? So more time, high expectations, um, strong focus on data, right? So, so those are things that we do. Um, but one of the things that truly does make our, us different is the intentional diversity of our student population. So the way we do this is we offer enrollment evenly to urban kids, and suburban kids, kids living in different municipalities. So our schools truly are mixed. They're mixed by design um, up front. And, um, and that is really central to the experiences that our kids have. Um, I, um, I taught in New York City. I taught in Harlem and uh, in Washington Heights. Anyone here? New York? New York Corps, thank you. Uh, in 95, probably none of you are that old. Um, <laughs> um, but. Um, but I, I taught in schools that, um, that look nothing like this mix, right? Highly, highly segregated schools. I went to school, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and hey, Western VA, thank you. Um, in, um, in a small town, and I went to an almost all white school myself, right? So highly segregated schools. And as a parent of three kids at Blackstone Valley Prep, one of the things that I'm most excited to say is that the conversations that my kindergartner, my second grader, and my fifth grader are having about issues of difference are things that I wasn't even grappling with until college, when I w sort of met the world, right? And, and that's powerful. Um, so BVP at a glance, so we're opening our sixth school this fall. I actually, I'm really confused. I thought this was a job panel, and all of you had resumes for me. Um, but you know we're growing uh, in Rhode Island, and we'd love for folks to join our team. Bill wants you guys to go out and open new schools around the country. That's great. Join ours. Um, but but it's really this chart that I want to talk about. This is the chart, right? So so I, I said it before, but I, I just want to underscore: like there is not a majority population in terms of racial demographic in our school program, right? And that is the opportunity. That is the opportunity. And so many of our schools they are hyper segregated. Why? Right? Why? It's, it's because of historical housing practices um, that, that have us have neighborhood schools that are hyper-segregated. Right? So our kids, were it not for Blackstone Valley Prep, would almost certainly go to their neighborhood schools. And those neighborhood schools on the urban side are 89% black, brown, low income. And on the suburban side, the same is true. It's just the opposite side of the same coin. 80 to 90% white and almost all middle or upper middle income. Right? And, and frankly, a lot of people are really comfortable with that. They are. Um, and, and for us, right, that, that's easy. But, but to, to really provide our young people with the experiences that, that I believe I want for my kids, and if it's truly good enough for my kids, I think it's probably good enough for all kids. Maybe that's selfish to say, but, but I do believe that. Um, the opportunity is to make this pie chart more common around our country. Um, I mentioned our mission before, and, um, and, and at the center of how we are able to attract urban and suburban together is this mission. Because at the end of the day, every parent is asking themselves this question, how can I do what's right and what's best for my kids, for my child, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all fairly utilitarian in that way. Um, and, and so we are centered on a college prep model 
uh, on a, which is a euphemism for success, right? I'm, I'm a career guy too. You want to go in the military, you want to have a career. I love it. But that euphemism for success is for, for all kids. Um, and, I, and I just want to close out with this image, which is to, to say when, when we do talk about what is possible and what I want for my kids, what I want for all kids, um, yeah, there's academic rigor in there, but there's joy, there's happiness, there's friendship, there's music, there's arts, there's sports, athletics, right? And so we want all of this richness in one school community. I know it's possible. And we're going to sit down and talk about how hard it is. Thank you. All right, so once again, if you have questions, please write them on the note cards and pass them out to the aisles. And hashtag is TFA25. So let's jump right in. Um, our schools are now more racially segregated than they have been uh, since any time since 1972. And as you saw from my slides, we began real desegregation in 1964, and by 1988, we had already begun to move backwards. Um, and we have moved backwards to this belief that um, we can, once again, this time we really will make separate schools equal. And we know that the data is very clear, that despite constant reform efforts from No Child Left Behind to Race to the Top, we've yet to close the opportunity gap in segregated schools. Educators, again, know the research on what works. So my first question uh, to the entire panel, and we can just start at my right and go down, is why do you think that so many school leaders resist pushing for intentional integration even when we know that it works? And what are the forces that are working against it? So, so I, I do think just pragmatically, most of us in this room don't, don't have an ability on Monday morning to go out and work in an integrated school, right? There are policies and practices that are out there that prevent us as individuals to do that, right? And, um, and I think that's important to keep in mind as, as we're going out and, and doing it. But, but the first thing that we have to be doing is talking about like we are today. Um, but but once, once you get past that, right, once, once you're in that opportunity to push for it, um, it becomes really, really hard really quickly. Um, entrenched forces really often press for the status quo because the status quo is easier, whatever that status quo is. Pushing for change, often incredibly, incredibly challenging. Um, suburban families um, who pay taxes and think that their suburban schools are fabulous are deeply offended when an upstart charter school with no track record for anything comes along and says, hey, um, you guys should walk away from your suburban schools and try this new thing out. Um, and that puts a target on you right away. Um, and, and then you get into issues of transportation and, um, and, and neighborhood schools are comfortable. Right? Walk down the street to the neighborhood school. And so I just, I feel like there are a number of these small pieces that, that add up that make it hard um, to just get started. Okay. So I guess I'll come at it from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, I think that things that we, I think everyone's afraid of change. I think people don't know what they're missing. They don't know what's possible. Uh, things are either happening out of a place of love or fear, and if it's fear-based, then they're just afraid of what they don't know. Um, in Connecticut, our education system is based on districts. We have, I believe, 149 different districts that each have their own boards of education. There's a lot of different boards of education and funding, and that we haven't figured out how to reallocate funds so that it feels like a win-win. In the Connecticut system, magnets do get additional funding through the State Department of Ed, through the, the settlement. So I think um, once we can figure out the win-win the and people can get over their fears and come visit Breakthrough and other magnet schools, that that pushback um, will become less and less of an issue. I guess I'd pick up where uh, Jeremy was for a minute. Uh, our schools are a reflection of our communities and our society, and I do think that um, prejudice, systematic racism, housing patterns are alive and well in this country, and I think until we acknowledge that, um, we can then not 
we can't then systemically fix our schools. Uh, and so I do believe that is the place we have to start. Uh, in Denver, if you're not familiar what's happening in Denver, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, there is huge gentrification going on in the city. Uh, and there are tremendous attitudes of prejudice and classism that are associated with that. Uh, and so I do believe um, to create these kinds of schools, Nicole, like I believe we have to have leaders, both in the educational community, in the, in the, in a, in the civic community, our politicians, who truly believe that this is worth fighting for. I don't think many people believe that today, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and in Denver, we have a cycle of election politics that says we'll do that after the next election. We'll do that after we win the next school bond. We'll do that after the next school board races because voting blocks are very powerful and in our city, the white uh, upper class voting block is very powerful. Uh, and so I do believe we have to take that issue on um, and I believe we have to commit to a set of principles and beliefs around integrated schools that, as we pointed out, all the data supports. Unfortunately, you can't sometimes take data and, and destroy prejudice. Uh, and so until we're willing to acknowledge all those things and create a coalition of change, uh, I think it's very difficult ultimately to create integrated schools uh, that aren't torn down by code by you know, this idea that we want kids for our schools for our kids in our own community, that we want our kids to bike to school. Like there's so much code in this country right now around neighborhood schools that is essentially racial politics playing out uh, in school code. And so I think all these things have to be acknowledged and we have to have the commitment and the courage to take that on um, before I think we're gonna have huge systemic change in this country around our schools. I would echo the policy considerations that Jeremy flagged. I would echo this notion of the reality of race relations in our country. Like that's what we're up against. And for those of you who haven't listened to Nicole's piece, I highly recommend that you do. And when you hear the comments coming from parents who are sitting on the receiving end of an integrated school environment, it'll give you a sense of just how big um, that force is that we are up against. And then the last thing that I would say is I think sometimes we unintentionally create the false choice of serving the kids who need it most and serving kids with what they need most. And so we can't let ourselves get caught in that false choice. Like we actually have to do more of everything. And um, I think in times when we are talking about expansion of charter schools and we're talking about finite resources and we're talking about school integration, we somehow get in this, well, if we do that, we can't do this other thing. Um, and I hope that we can learn to care about this as much and put it at the top of the agenda of priorities. I mean, it's always interesting how adaptable the language is to segregation, how um, if you are in a white segregated area, there is a call for neighborhood schools. If you are in New York City, there is a call to unbound everyone from the neighborhood and let kids have choice and go wherever they want. Um, so I think the calling out of race and racism is very important when we're talking about why schools are not diverse. Um, in 1944, the Swedish economist uh, Gunnar Myrtle described what he called the American dilemma, is which he said that white Americans, or excuse me, that Americans believe in an American creed of equality for all, no matter what race, um, even as we are willing to accept deep and grave inequalities um, for black and brown children. So we know that today, when you poll most Americans, most Americans say that they do believe in integration and they want integrated schools for their own children. So what that means tends to be a very small black population and a willingness to accept a larger Latino population. And I even noticed with the demographics that many of your schools are reflecting, the black population in your integrated school still tends to be fairly small. Um, so how do we create then, knowing that there is a this disconnect between the ideal and the reality, how, do, how does one build the political will in communities and the necessary coalitions to integrate schools? And I'd like to um, specifically have Ju Julie and Christy, who have two very different types of schools, to talk about that coalition building and building the political will. We 
When you when, just to start though, when you were um, first giving your presentation and you talked about the 13% African American population, it brought me right back into the classroom. In my third year teaching in at Fremont High, my I re vividly recalled uh, Nicole, one of my students, coming in and saying, "I don't I don't understand. I just learned that the that there's only 12% of the American population is African." African-American or black, and our whole school is black. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of hung in the air. It was just a really awkward moment. And, and those, are the, those are some of my root experiences, too, that create the why for me about why integration is so important. Um, the, Nicole, you're going to have to repeat your question just so I'm more It, it was a bit of a long question, so I'll go back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, and I want to get to the my point. question is when you have when you have values that are in direct conflict to the actual actions, how do you then build the coalitions and the political will to integrate schools um, when people are are living very different values than what they profess? Where does how does one build that will? Well, I mean, Elizabeth Horton Chef and her team of her family teams, I think, were just a force in that, and it was really. I think the, the way that they approached the, the legal system and that it was a have to um, was exactly what Connecticut needed and it's the only way that things were gonna change in Connecticut. She uses a lot of the same terms that you do. We call Connecticut up south. So that's, that's something that she, she's very upfront about and it's just continuing to, I think the magnet system, the whole concept of magnets, building our magnet schools within Hartford and then having our suburban students, our non-isolated race, white Asian students coming to our schools is um, another way. I don't know, it's really overcoming the forces of nature which I think are, tend to be more that we, we tend to go into segregation just in the same ways that our character education theme and our curriculum is not natural. We have to be trained, we have to be forced in some ways to create this, and then we have to have the right people in place, the right families, students, um, teachers, and, uh, and leaders to make it a great place. So I wanna actually, if, if I could, I wanna talk about that word forced, mm -hmm. okay? Because um, you also talked about not using force. Yes. And it's interesting how that is interesting. Um, force is a bad word, but we know that segregation was forced. And that as long as uh, we were using force for inequality as a country, we were willing to accept that. We are not willing to accept using force for equality. Um, so That's so I, I interesting. Think that that is a, I love that. <laughs> that, we, that. The fact that when we're talking about integration, we have to start that by saying, but we're not going to make anyone do it. Um, is an interesting starting point for a conversation about justice. Mm -hmm. So you're coming from a perspective where your um, voluntary integration program came as a result of a mandatory order from a court. And you guys are doing truly voluntary integration, which is you're trying to create an environment that will attract certain people. So would you mind actually, when, when you're answering this question about political will, talking about that aversion of force, um, and how we can truly have inequality if the only, or equality if the only way is, is if we can somehow entice white Americans to give up something. So I think this is at the core of the fundamental issues we face as a country, right? So I don't have an easy answer to this question about how to change political will. I'm working <laughs> on it. But what we do see is in the same way, we talk a lot about single stories, like the danger of telling ourselves a single story about any one population. And so we just partnered with 400 organized parents in Kansas City, Missouri, who were asking for a diverse school. Now, they were asking to also stay in their neighborhood in Midtown, Kansas City. They were also asking for a rigorous school. They were asking for a lot of things. But I think one thing that we've realized is important for us is we have to lead with what we're actually trying to do here. So if we get caught up in too much and like, look, the school's really high performing and, and look, you're gonna have all these social and emotional outcomes, we're starting to skirt the issue of we want racial integration. And if that's not the school you want, this isn't the right school for you because we're founded on the idea that that's important, right? And then what we're finding is allies and coalitions of parents who do want that. Now that doesn't mean they know how to do that. It doesn't mean they've lived with that. It doesn't mean they've had the opportunity. It doesn't mean that's gonna be easy. And it doesn't mean there aren't moments where you think, oh my gosh, I don't know how we're gonna get there. But our hope is that by pushing through that and pushing through that together, we can start to come up with some best practices, not just about what you do in the classroom, but 
when you've got all your families working together, what do we do about that? And I think it's going to be hard. But I, I hear you on the forced. And I'll tell you my um, honest answer. I know this is being live streamed, so here we go on the, <laughs> on the authenticity. But um, it's been hard to get support for these kinds of schools. And so I find myself dancing in a place where I can meet people where they are. So they will help us get some of these open so then we can push harder. And I don't know right now if people are ready to hear forced integration. And I hope I'm wrong. So all of you people out there who are listening and people in here, I hope I'm wrong. I hope we all are ready to take a stand for that because we know that's what it's going to take. But we're finding it hard to even do voluntary integration in both the cities that we're in. So let's talk about um, how you guys have actually gone about specifically creating these diverse learning environments. One of the things that I know from New York City is there are a lot of white parents who want integrated schools, but when we've created such an unequal system where schools are, for instance, my, like my daughter's school, which is entirely black and it, it's about 90% free and reduced lunch, um, we know that that is a school that is going to be very difficult to integrate. Um, and so we're having to deal with this legacy that we've created. So can you specifically talk to the people in this room about how you created these diverse learning environments? What were the specific steps? And if we could start with Bill. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on the last conversation and go with this one, which is I, I do believe um, and I, I, I agree completely with Christy that this is challenging work and I don't know if people are fully ready for it. Um, and I, I worry um, that we ultimately allowed the, the court ordered uh, resegregation to actually, I mean, the desegregation to actually get unwound. So um, public policy long term, I believe, unfortunately, always has to have a little bit of self interest in it. And, I feel like the self-interest our country showed was we're not re we're not going to do this, um, and so I worry about how we're going to continue to ask people to do this again um, when we just spent 20 years unraveling what we did in the 70s. Um, and so our belief, ultimately, to your question, Nicole, is we have to create great schools that all kids want to go to, and we have to create great schools that. Any family in the city of Denver, what we hope is that any family uh, that has a fifth grade child will sit down at the dinner table and say, we have to consider a DSST public school for our child. It may not be the right school for them ultimately. They may want to go to the art school or some other school, but we believe that our mission is to put our schools in front of every family at the dinner table and to have good enough schools that regardless of background, they will say, that is a school I could see my child in, and it's an excellent school. And but so, how does that work in practice? Because that sounds like what I've heard every school official ever say was, we will integrate these schools by building really great schools. And it doesn't, it doesn't actually typically work. So, um, and we know just from research that parents are actually looking, parents who say they are looking at test scores and other things, when you look at their click data, they're actually looking at the racial demographics of a school and that that is overcoming yes. whatever um, other factors they say they want. So what does that actually mean that we're gonna build a school? Because um, we know just build, putting great academic programs in a school, putting strong teachers in, cannot overcome the issue of race and people's fears about race. So how do you actually do that? Yeah, so I, I would say, I mean, there's two things. One is we have created lottery structures like Jeremy that create preferences um, that allow us, I think, to intentionally integrate through the lottery process and don't allow a single group to potentially be overrepresented. Um, I think that, is, um, that has been an important part of our model. Um, and then I do, I, I do believe ultimately there has to be um, tremendous community outreach um, where you are bringing your school uh, not to the community because you want to be there but because they're inviting you in and that you are creating understanding and inclusiveness where again families can see um, their children, their traditions being honored in your school on top of the great academic program that we have. And I think there has to be a real intentionality about that. And to Christy's point, that's very difficult. Um, but I think we've succeeded in a number of places of doing that, um, where we have families from different backgrounds, different races that are very, very comfortable uh, and believe this is their school. Um, it's not somebody else's school. And I think that's very important, uh, but challenging. 
Jeremy, you look like you dying to answer that question. Well, I, I, just, I just think really pragmatically, I mean, some, sometimes where you site a building or a school really matters. So for example, we've learned, sadly the hard way, that um, when you put an intentionally diverse school that offers urban and suburban e equally, on the suburban side of the line, the suburban kids are much more likely to attend than when you go literally a half mile in the other direction. And that's incredibly sad. But we've seen that happen in our experience, right? And so what neighborhood you ultimately place the kid in, um, or the, the building in, um, can, can truly matter. And so when you're thinking about creating these types of schools, you need to think about, okay, well, you know, pragmatically, a parent who has really poor choices of where their kid can go to school, they are applying to every charter school lottery in the state. They are desperately seeking to go anywhere, right? And so you could put that school on Mars and they're gonna fight their way to get there, right? But on the other side, the, the suburban family who maybe thinks they have two or three good options, or they could take their privilege and, and, and buy a private school and go there, um, you know, if it, it's one thing to go to this mixed school and so they get over that or they, they, they're excited about that depending, um, but if they, if they decide to do that and they have to go into that zip code, sometimes we, we see that being, being problematic. And that's sad. And Julie, I wonder if you could talk about this because if you listen to part two of our This American Life, Life piece, what was clear was that part of the tactic for uh, the magnet schools in Hartford is not talking to white parents about diversity at all in recruitment and instead trying to bring parents in just by selling the program and downplaying that this is part of an integration program. I didn't get that memo. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that. I, I actually didn't. Um, in, when Yes, so the, if you come to, actually today, if you were in, in, in Hartford, you could go to a magnet fair and it would be a big room similar to our exhibition hall with everybody standing and selling their school, why it's so great and why your child should go there. And the first thing I say is about the diversity of our school. I, I, um, I think that is tremendously important and it's a real added value for all families. I think that, and, and also I want to just say on the micro level, when you talk about creating a great integrated school, we literally sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and we ensure that every single classroom reflects our entire school population. So whichever classroom you come to, it is a micro level of our school. I think that's another hidden thing that when people think of magnet schools, they think of different tracks within the school. And I think that is not, not the ideal. So I didn't get the memo. Um, <laughs> I think that a lot of principles, there's a continuum of awareness among our magnet principles about the, the, the history of our magnet schools and about what the values are behind the magnet schools. I'm not, I'm on the continuum of, of the diversity, but um, it's something that we do celebrate. We're a global school of, for students of character. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to ask uh, one more question, and then I think we're going to go to the, the questions from the audience. Um, so my last question is, so much of this conversation, because it is about equity and justice for black and brown students, are always framed around the benefits uh, uh, to those students. And I think a lot of times white parents don't understand the benefit to them. As a kid who was bust, I like to say that those kids got as much from me as I got from them. Um, but can you talk about what you see in your own schools and the ways that being an integrated learning environment, not just in feel-good ways, that these kids who are coming from black and brown communities are smart, that they're inquisitive, that they have things to offer in the classroom. I wonder if you could talk to our audience about what you've seen um, the benefit has been for your white students and your white families. And any of you who want to jump in on that. I, mean, I, think, I think when you think about the, the, what the content of the discussions that happen when analyzing text, because you are analyzing text always with a lens of perspective, the, the richer the diversity of the room, the greater the perspective, and, and that helps all kids. And, um, and we see that in our classrooms. Uh, and, and, and it's especially true um, when, when we do a good job, and we don't always do a good job, but when we do a good job of putting diverse texts in front of our kids as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that's one small example of that. Does anyone else want to answer? I mean, going back to the single story idea, I think it's hard to maintain a single story about a group that you know well. 
or individuals that you know well. And I think when that separation is there, when the otherness is there, you can fall into a trap of telling yourself a single story. So some of that gets back to the school design. I don't think that happens just by putting everyone in the same room, right? You've got to be very intentional about, in our case, we do project-based learning and we talk a lot about social and emotional skills that we build. We talk about curiosity and ways to keep your mind open and recognize when you're telling yourself a single story. But that, without question, benefits all children. And I think, actually, in, in cases where you are segregated into a life of privilege, the media right now and the American narrative can leave you wholly unable to understand, really, what it's like to live in an area that's not yours. And I think that is detrimental for leadership capacity in the future, um, specifically for those families. Okay, so we're going to go to the audience questions. These are some good questions. I can't wait. Um, so this first question should be fairly easy for you guys to answer, but I think is very important. Uh, to those of you who have integrated schools, what are the stats and um, breakdowns of your teachers? How diverse are your teaching stats? Very white. <laughs> Just go down the line. Yeah, I would say very white. <laughs> I was just going to put this short to the point. Yeah, we're, we're uh, I think, 20% of our staff identifies as people of color. Um, we are encouraged that we're trending in the 35 to 40% range for our new hires the last two years, um, but it's not good enough. We try to measure our population so that we're creating more than 50% of our staff are members of color and we're meeting that goal. However, when you break that up by different levels within administration, teaching, teaching assistance, we have work to do to ensure that the diversity is at every level, which is our intention. So if I may ask a follow-up to those who said very white, how is that acceptable and what are you doing about it? So, so when you think about those levels, as Christy talked about, the, the school leaders, I, I think, are the face of the organization. So half our school leaders are school leaders of color. But, but I don't, and I think that that provides an opportunity for them to be the best recruiters out there to pull in others um, who, who are diverse and different. But, but we, we're in a hyper-segregated state. 10% of the kids coming out of Rhode Island College um, education programs um, are people of color. So that means about 16 to 18 graduates from Rhode Island College every year eligible to teach certification rules and regulations are people of color. And so we are with the rest of Rhode Island fighting over them um, and, uh, and we're fighting. And we've got a team at NEMNET today trying to find folks and we have a booth upstairs, anyone here. Um, did I mention we're hiring? Um, Yeah, it's a, in, in Hartford, it's a, it's a problem district-wide in Hartford to have, a, we are seeking a much more diverse teaching population than we have, and we're, I have an opening next year, and I will, I'm looking for Teach for America, science possibly, um, so we're looking for, to add, whenever we have an opening, we have, we don't have a lot of staff turnover, um, and we also are going on our, I went, this morning I went to the Teach for All program and we talked about student leaders and developing leaders. We are hopefully, we're, we're trying to recruit our students to become our next teachers in our school. So that's a, a big piece for us. Okay, the, the investigative reporter in me wants to ask more questions but I'm gonna move on. Uh, I guess I would say try harder. Um, <laughs> so, this question actually goes to like, the heart of, um, of a concern that I have often with charters and magnet schools, um, which is that it's not a zero-sum game. By your ability to attract through your programming very diverse schools, that's also then having a negative and opposite effect on traditional public schools, which are tending to then lose diversity. Um, so the question, that wasn't the question, that was my prefacing of the question, sorry is what needs to happen to ensure the students enrolled in traditional schools also have access to intentionally diverse learning communities. And actually, could we, I'd love to start with uh, you because the thing that always gets me about um, Hartford is it's a model, but half of the black kids get neither integration or magnets, and that's considered a success story. So what, what can be done to ensure 
access to this type of learning environment uh, for traditional public school students. I think we have a lot of us in Hartford and in Connecticut <clears throat> wringing our hands over the same question. So equity is at the forefront of, of Hartford's push. The I have to say on a personal level, I feel that we are, when you walk into a, a, an administrator's meeting, half of the schools or most of the, you know, some portion of the schools are neighborhood schools and some portion of the schools are magnet schools. There's a lot of tension, there's a lot of feeling of have and have nots. The reality is that students who come from our suburban towns get a different, a higher amount of funding and that does affect our school budgets. And it is a problem and I think when we get the answer, there's gonna be a lot of relief because things are not right. And I know that the neighborhood schools in Hartford are providing an excellent education to all of the students. Um, I think that we just, I think it is an issue of resources going back to what you said. And I think that we're, we're not there yet. Okay, does one other person want to answer that? This is at the forefront of our work in Denver with, the, with charters in the district. And I do believe, um, you know, Denver's leading the way here in, in our commitment jointly, charters and district, to have enrollment equity. Uh, and so we do have enrollment zones um, where we are now equitably taking students, um, A, through a, a process where everybody chooses. And so district and charter schools are literally on the same one-page document where you just check your choices um, of either district or charter school. You don't, may not even know that there are district or charter schools. Secondly, we share equitably in late enrollments. Um, we hold back seats now in our schools so that kids who come who traditionally are um, in, of higher degrees of poverty in the summer and in the fall, we hold back enrollment seats for those students in our schools, even though our schools are oversubscribed. Uh, we share mid-year entries, um, and we're very committed to now serving uh, our share of students with uh, particularly high special needs. So. Um, I think this is really important work together, and I think um, in Denver, I think we have a commitment to serve all kids. This is not the charter sector doing its thing and the district doing its thing. We, as a collective uh, education community, serve 90,000 students, and our commitment has to be all of those students in all of our schools. Okay, so the next question is, um, as you've all mentioned, there are some white parents who want integration. In your experience, can you identify common experiences that have shaped those parents' beliefs, and can we make more of those parents? <laughs> Do you want to start, Julie? Sure. I mean, what's interesting is to hear parents talk about how they went to integrated schools. So they were in the generation where schools were actually integrated. So in some ways, what we're doing is trying to create more. It's like, look, if we have more integrated schools, people will come out understanding the value of integrated schools, and maybe that will help us as we go forward. Anyone else have a response to that? No? So this question is for you, or Jeremy, specifically. Um, have you come up against bias from suburban parents, and how do you deal with that? Ebola. Last year, one of my teachers shared a text with one of our school leaders and ultimately with me asking what the school was doing to deal with the Ebola crisis and how we were going to keep his daughter safe in the school because there were so many kids of West African descent. So th this, this is hard stuff, right? And I'm not equipped to deal with that. I don't know who in this room is equipped to really deal with that, right? You know, my board chair, who's um, Colombian American, refers to these parents often as foxy parents, right? The Fox News watching parents. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, often, it's often really challenging because you know, the, the daughter's amazing, great, great, great young lady. And um, the parents are just in, in a different place than we are. Um, and so we are working hard to try to equip ourselves. We've named intentional diversity for several years as like a major programmatic goal. We have a network-wide um, diversity committee that does work on initiatives around not only recruitment of staff, but how do we support the staff that we do have to be smarter and better about um, interacting with, with one another, with kids and with families on these major issues of difference. Um, but. It is hard because you get questions like that 
because diverse means all perspectives, including trumpeteers. Okay, um, what, prof what professional development do you provide to teachers to help build culturally sensitive dynamics among students? And I imagine, since many of your teaching staffs aren't that diverse, this is a particularly important question. Uh, so can we start with, well, does anyone want to volunteer? Should I call on someone? <laughs> okay, well, let's start with Julie. Sure. <laughs> um, we're, we're doing better with that. Um, we realized that we, we definitely were not using um, our time to acknowledge the cultural differences the way that we need to. And um, through the, actually the district leadership is, is providing a lot of conversations and modeling for all of our teachers in Hartford related to race and culture. So we're almost starting up, building ourselves up to that point. We're having some conversations among doing some panel discussions like this for our staff to talk about race, developing the comfort level and the cultural um, language that our teachers need for themselves to expand their awareness and sensitivity, and we're going to bring that out to the students. So we've got, a, we've got a way to go, but we've got a plan. Okay. Bill, would you like to answer? Sure. I mean, I think we are working very hard to uh, use a, a, a different lens than we have in the past, I think, around uh, understanding difference and helping our staff and ourselves truly ask the question of what is our lens every time we do something. Uh, and I think that's a discipline, it's a commitment, it's, um, it has to become part of our normal everyday interactions and I think we're working very hard uh, in our schools and in our, our home office to um, really identify and understand our privilege, understand um, our, our students, ourselves in a whole different way and, and I think it's a foundational piece of who we are now that is an ongoing journey. So we spend a fair bit of time on it. It's not traditional PD, if you will, on teaching do nows or teaching this. It's, it's really um, a commitment to become part of our culture in a, in a deep way and that we have to leave time for, I think, very important, hard conversations that we're having, I think, on a regular basis now. Okay. So this question is, <clears throat> while the notion of an intentionally diverse charter is certainly laudable, uh, the same legal mechanisms that allow each of you to select diverse populations allows others to select populations that are not diverse, perhaps intentionally as well. Would our efforts be better served addressing better public zoning, school attendance policies for all students in your cities? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's either or. It's both and in Rhode Island, the governor is is pushing for statewide choice. So we're one of, um, I think, six states in the country that don't actively have policies that allow for any form of interdistrict choice at all. And um, because the, the conversation in Rhode Island, the education conversation is so concentrated on 5% of the kids who go to charters and there's this giant debate, um, I, I think she's trying to move the conversation in a new direction to say, well, wait a second, why don't we allow every family um, to have some form of choice and to open and break down district boundaries. Um, and that, by definition, I think we'll, we'll start to, um, to make that happen. And I think we're, we're playing a, a role in helping force that conversation. So what does that mean, statewide choice? So if you live in North Providence, you can choose to send your child to Providence if Providence opts into a program that says, we'll use our excess capacity to allow kids to come to school across you know, borders. Right? So instead of having um, 39 school districts all with borders around them, right, you, you open up the doors so that any Rhode Islander could, could potentially go to any Rhode Island school. So choice, of course, is always interesting because choice is always sold as a, a model for equity, but we know that choice typically benefits those who are most well off and is typically used by those who can access it. Um, and that many circumstances, choice has led to uh, worsening situations for those who are who would need it the most. Um, so do you think that a choice model can ever be really equitable for the neediest children? I think it's far more equitable than what we have right now. Yeah? Absolutely. Where? And, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking very specifically about Rhode Island where you have so many kids who are on giant charter school waiting lists whose local neighborhood schools have been chronically failing in state control since the 90s have um, tried every um, 
NCLB intervention known um, and are still not getting any opportunity and to provide some of those kids, most of those kids or all of those kids with access to higher performing schools, that, that's a move in the right direction. Okay, does anyone else want to take yeah, that? I would just say again, in, in, in Denver, I, I think you're right, Nicole, and that choice can be disproportionate at times in terms of opportunity, but I think in Denver, it's got to be, to Jeremy's point, both and, and we, um, every kid has a choice now, and every kid must make an affirmative choice, and it is incumbent upon the district and us as providers to ensure access to all families to those choices, and I think when that happens, um, I do believe um, that will provide the most equitable outcome. The real challenge in Denver is not around choice, it's around still the neighborhood carve out within choice, which traditional schools are asserting now because very powerful families and voting blocks are asserting neighborhood preference for a school that was once, let's say, 40% diverse that's now down to 15% because that assertion of neighborhood choice has driven low income families out on purpose. So I think that that is the real, I think, challenge now is once you create a choice environment, this old notion of neighborhood schools, I think, creeps back in very quickly to preserve, I think, a segregation approach. I mean, I think that's what's so um, disheartening about these efforts. It's, it's all very complex, and, and every action seems to have an opposite reaction. Um, neighborhoods that are gentrifying are not or a neighborhood school would be very diverse, those schools don't become diverse, um, so then choice can be a bad thing, um, a neighborhood school could be a good thing, and, and, and I think that that, um, for those of you who work in this and for people like me who report on it, is the system just seems to adapt to inequality, um, no matter what. So I think, are we, okay, so, that is, I guess, the final question. Thank you all from the audience for those excellent questions that you asked. You. So now we're going to close out. Um, and we have a pretty diverse group of people here in the audience today. And so I guess if each of you could take two minutes and um, talk about if, if you had one piece of advice that you would give the people in this room on how to build an intentionally integrated learning community, what would that be? Each of you just take two minutes, please. Yes, go ahead. So I think this actually builds on what we were just talking about, the system defaulting to inequity. So I don't think we're gonna solve this problem alone as educators, and when I look at specifically housing developments and the economic implications far outside of the education sector, it's gonna take a value shift across multi-sector work. And so we've gotta find a way to partner on the front end with people who do value this so we can get ahead of the default setback. And the thing I would encourage all of us to do as we're reaching across those lines and doing what I think personally I just haven't done well through my career as an educator, which is bringing in people who are outside of education to get on the front end of our design, we have to be real about the cost of this. The cost of not doing this work is a future of the worst of today, exaggerated, expanded, exponential harm for our kids. And so I don't know that we really talk about that when we talk about what we are and aren't doing in the context of our schools. Thank you. I would say three things. One is, and I think Christy said this really well at the beginning of the panel, put this at the top of the list of, of the school you want to be a part of or that you want to design. It has to be not the fifth thing that your school is going to be. It has to be at the top of the list with academic results and great culture and all the other things. I think we have to prioritize this to the point that the cost is so great if we don't. So that would be number one. Number two. I do believe we're in an era now of building coalitions, and I hope you would, you would think about what is the coalition of community members, of former, of, of young people, um, of other educators uh, who look like you, who don't look like you, who can be part of a founding coalition to think about how to build a truly inclusive, diverse school. Uh, I think that'd be number two. Number three, I, I do believe um, that there is a commitment to um, 
quality that's so important because I think unfortunately uh, parents won't choose it ultimately for all the reasons that we don't like, whether it's prejudice or other or housing, uh, you know, kind of location of the school, whatever you whatever you say, um, they'll they'll choose all those excuses and they'll never give you a chance to build the school if it's not of high quality. So just think about those three things as you uh, commit to doing this work. I guess the way I would start with would be to actually be intentional about it. I think two mi macro answers are regionalization of school districts um, and also creating all, dist all schools as magnet schools and keeping in mind that in, in, as the district leaders how schools will reflect the overall community that is there. And then I think from the micro level, from wherever anyone is at, is to take yourself up a level. So if you're thinking about it, start talking about it. If you're talking about it, take an action. If you're in a classroom or in a school that is completely segregated, reach across a town line, reach within your town to create more integration and more opportunities for integration to help demystify what is what those barriers are and then and then just go from there so that the actions then become part of the system and I think between the acceleration that um, Christy and, and the rest of the, our district and, and systems leaders next to me are doing and um, the, the values and ideals that we have that we're gonna get to the next level. I, I agree. I would say you name it, say it up front, and build it into everything you're doing. I would say that you need to study deeply so we've had lots of teams of teachers come to places like E.L. Haynes, which has a race and equity training that is incredible. Um, find those places around the country that are doing good work. Visited some schools in Brooklyn that are doing amazing work um, and bring them in as well. So you need to study this stuff deeply. And then finally, I think you just, I mean, everyone here, um, as, um, as you think about the work, if you ask yourself one simple question, is the decision I'm making right now good enough for my own kids. And you'll be fine, you'll get there. I was gonna end with something, but I actually think that's kind of the perfect place to end um, because so often the discussion is not about the children and there are children in these schools and they are being harmed and we are not doing right by them. So I think that's exactly right. Um, these schools aren't good enough for your own children, are they good enough for anyone's? And thank you all for coming and for the work that you do. And thank you to the panelists.